Welcome back, everybody. It's Joe Solari, and this is the Business of Writing with Craig Martell, coming to you live from the Subarctic. All right, Craig. So today we've got we're going to open up the secrets of the pyramids and talk about pricing strategies. I know you've been working real hard on your book, and uh, we've been talking a little bit about this. So thought we would um, give people a little sneak peek into all the secrets of pricing. Secrets. Yeah, that's a, a lot of the stuff is obvious, but uh, <clears throat> yeah, just finished the book a couple days ago uh, after uh, rereading it and sent it to the beta readers of which Joe was one and provided some good input. So we've tweaked things up already and it, uh, it'll go to the editor probably today. <clears throat> and then uh, it's set up for pre-order for receiving on the 8th, which means I got to have it uploaded. I'll probably upload it by the 2nd or earlier. If I can upload it by the 31st, I'll make it go live that same day. Might as, might as well get that pre-order cash this month. There you go. Because we always talk about cash flow as well. We, all of our conversations always degenerate to cash flow. So <laughs> get, that, get that pre-order cash, which is only- Hey, uh, wait a minute. Degenerate or elevate? <clears throat> go into one of the most important things in running a business, which is cash flow. <clears throat> so uh, yeah, if I can uh, get it launched this month, get those uh, 150, 200 uh, pre-orders uh, delivered uh, the cash this month. So I have it by New Year's and then uh, get all the page reads and the other stuff next month. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I, I th uh, in reading it, I think that you've, you've really created a great um, product around this industry, right? I mean, to kind of preface things that we're going to talk about is, you know, if you were to go Google pricing strategy, 90% of what you'll find on pricing strategy is not applicable to this industry. Um, I used to uh, <clears throat> be a partner in a pricing analytics company where we had methods of taking products and by adjusting prices drop three to 5% to the bottom line. I mean, it was crazy what we could do, but that stuff doesn't apply to books because it's not a traditional thing where, you know, an adjustment in the price immediately hits the quantity of, you know, the, the, the sales volume, right? Because such a big part of what we're dealing with in this is genre specific mm -hmm. and is influenced heavily. We can't discount this is, is influenced by, um, you know, the quality of the product. If people are digging the product, right? Yeah, the uh, <clears throat> the ultimate social proof. Uh, you can you can drop a lot of money on advertising and marketing and sell the first book, sell one book, but then you're not going to sell the second book because people will have read the first book, and if they hate it, guess guess you're, what you're not going to sell next. And especially as your social proof, as you get your uh, hey, look at that, I got a thousand reviews. Yeah, but it's three point one stars. It's two point two stars because people hate the book. Uh, then, uh, you know, book two isn't going to sell. Yeah, I think a, a great point on that is, um, did you see that one of the first reads for this month? I think it was called Quantum. Oh, my God. It was, it was like half a book. That was, that was a horrible thing. Right? Like, yeah. so, th that, was, that might be career crippling, right? Like, to have yeah. a, thousand, a thousand reviews and your book's got two stars. Thir when I saw it, it had 1,300 and it was like 2.3 stars. Yeah. It was just brutalized, but it was, uh, they, they put it everywhere because even I bought it. I'm like, hey, okay, 99 cents. It had the, it had the moving <laughs> yeah, cover the fancy, as like, part of it. You talk it about had, <clears throat> Amazon throwing their money behind the launch. Yeah. Right. And uh, reading the reviews, I haven't read the book, but uh, reading the reviews, it's like, this is half a book. It's, it starts a story. And, just, and I looked at it, it's like, this is 75 pages? Get the hell out of here. It was only 75 pages? I, I think so. I, I mean, it was. Uh, yeah, I didn't download it. It uh, wasn't quite uh, what we expected when we bought it. Mm -hmm. So I, t t the reason I brought that up was exactly to your point. Is like, um, if you go and spend a bunch of money to um, disappoint a lot of people, then it's really going to be hard to recover from that. Yeah, you can sell one book, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but if you want a career, you got to be in it for the long game. And so that's why uh, the pricing strategies, we talk about uh, full price, also known as regular price, uh, your discount, 
or sale price. And then you have your uh, advertising, your marketing, your promotions, those things that go into whether it's at full price or a discounted price. Mm -hmm. And what you do to get your book into as many hands as possible at the highest price that they'll pay. So where where you want you want to start with full price and kind of talk about some of the things that <clears throat> um, you know you you found has helped your career? Sure, sure. Full price. Uh, you you pick it. When I first published, my books were two ninety nine because hey, seventy percent royalty. That's it. I have no. Uh, confidence that I know what I'm doing, that the books are any good, that uh, uh, I deserve to be where I am. And it didn't take long before <clears throat> I embrace, I always embrace the principle for dress, dress for the job you want. Great concept. Because, well, when I was enlisted in the Marine Corps, I wore polo shirts. I wore the same thing the officers wore because I'm like, I want to be up there someday. And I, I did, I got there. And then I sort of wore t-shirts as an officer because I know they, <laughs> that, now, now that'll teach you guys. For, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like I want to be a club, uh, a member of a club where you'll have me. I think uh, Groucho Marx said Groucho that. Marx, yeah. <clears throat> so uh, uh, dress for the job you want. I raised my prices to three ninety nine, and very shortly thereafter, I raised them to four ninety nine in all my books because my genre, because now I, once I zeroed in and said, yes, this is my genre. That's what the books were the regular price for a single book. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I have all my books. I have uh, a book that's actually like 37,000 words. It's not even a novel, but it's in a series of novels. And uh, I, I priced it at four ninety nine, and nobody balked. Nobody mm -hmm. balked at all because it's, it's another story in that series. It was just a shorter plot. It just mm -hmm. wasn't as much. <clears throat> well, I know like with uh, Susie's books, they're, they're short, like they're less than 20,000 words. Now, granted, there's a lot of photography in them. Yeah. Right. But her books are all 449. They have been that way. Um, and I think that when you understand that, like you, what you're talking about is that what's the pricing expectation in that genre or niche, as long as you're delivering on that, the tropes, the yeah. cover, the editing, right? That's where you can make the bigger mistakes. Yeah. Um, people are going to be, accepting of that pricing. And I know a couple authors um, have done similar to you where it's same kind of thing where they kind of came in a little sheepish, like, okay, then I'm early in this game. And then once they established themselves and they had that base, they then started to price appropriately to where they were within that marketplace. And that, you know, uh, one of the things that you and I were talking about yesterday is, you know, if, if you can make that move from four, you know, three ninety nine to four ninety nine, um, you would have to lose like seventeen percent of the volume to not make money on that move. You know, so would that happen? Like in your case, it didn't. Well, and if you didn't, then that's a seventeen percent kicker to your bottom line. Mm, yeah, and seventeen percent is not bad. That's I'm running an ad right now <clears throat> on a book. And by five in the morning, that one book just went over $40 in earnings for the day. Well, I'm spending $40 a day on advertising. So everything from this point forward, the other 19 hours of the day of revenue is gravy. Mm. <clears throat> so I'm getting that book into the people's hands. They're, I'm getting the page reads. I'm getting the sales, a, a nice balance. And uh, uh, I'm in the gravy already mm. on that, uh, my best ad. Well, you know... <laughs> I think you've told you my father-in-law's business is a uh, uh, home brewing supply store. It's the oldest in the country. It's, it's a pretty big deal, but I mean, it, it's been run like a hundred year old store for a long time. Yeah. And we, I brought in some of my pricing analytics stuff. And when he finally let me kind of get control of the reins on some of it and he kind of lost his mind the other day because he's like, Hey, sales have dropped by 10%. I'm like, yes, the top line sales have dropped by 10%. And gross uh, net profit has increased by 135%. What can you spend? You can spend the net profit, not the top line. Like, yeah, yeah. We, 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 there was some, some, some business went away. And I know from doing this in the past is those customers that left, you didn't want them anyhow. Those are your toughest customers. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're your hardest to please. They want, they want the stuff for free. 
Basically. And they're demanding about it. Yeah, yeah, they never came into you and said, you know what? You guys are way, way cheaper on all this stuff than everybody else. Maybe you should raise your prices. They never came and said that to you. That would be a good yeah. customer, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's, it's a similar kind of thing <clears throat> as understanding, you know, having that kind of money drop to your bottom line in any business makes your life really, really easy. It makes things a lot better. That's right. That's yeah. right. So, um, yeah, so you, you kind of came up with your full price strategy. And then I know in the book you kind of talk about launching and then I, I, you want to talk about that or do you want to talk about that as part of discounting? Or? <clears throat> well, the, uh, once you determine the full price of your book, that's where you have to determine your marketing campaign. What are you going to do with this book at full price? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> this is where you uh, set up. Uh, do I want to run a discount on it? Do I, if, if, is it not the first book, if it's a third, fourth, fifth, or my, uh, the most recent book was the seventh book in the series. I, uh, when I first started publishing with, uh, with Michael and Ellen BPN, we would launch the book at 99 cents and keep it there for a set number of days, <clears throat> anywhere from one to two to seven days, depending on uh, whether we were trying to get traction, get a, get a lot of uh, excitement, get a lot of sales right out of the chute. And what we found is that <clears throat> there was a huge proportion of people who were willing to pay full price, but since we were offering it at 99, they were buying it at 99 cents. Mm -hmm. We weren't getting the page reads. We were getting a lot of sales, but a sale at 99 cents, earning you 35 uh, cents each, you could sell a thousand books and you, you just made 350 bucks. That doesn't even cover the cost of the cover for a thousand sales. If you sell a thousand books, you want to make a, a little bit of money. Mm. So <clears throat> weaning those people off that 99 cent deal wasn't uh, easy and it was not easy to the point of being impossible <clears throat> because we found out uh, as we re uh, conducted market research on the, the audience that we have a lot of fixed income people and they do want to buy the books, but they can't afford to buy the books at 499 because mm. they read four or five books a week but they can buy them for a dollar. So what we started doing was we launched at full price on, on the Monday and then Saturday for one day, we price it down to 99 cents. Mm -hmm. So that first week we would get our hardcore fans that were willing to pay full price to get the book. And uh, we'd get the page reads too, because people in Kindle Unlimited aren't incentivized to just buy it instead. And then if, if they liked it, wanted to buy it, they could do that on Saturday for one day. Mm. <clears throat> and, the Amazon follower notice. We've done. A, we've gone a lot of work to uh, build up our Amazon followers. When you could do giveaways, you can't do that anymore. So my uh, my hundred thousand followers or whatever it might be, <clears throat> uh, will then get an email sometime in two to four weeks after launch, and so they're going to get that email at uh, at, at four ninety nine, <clears throat> and so I get a nice bump, and that's a really nice revenue bump. You pick up a hundred sales at four ninety nine just out of the blue. That's a nice day. Makes for a good day. Mm. Well, <clears throat> so I, I, the, the full ahead. price, that's, that's what you set it at. So the reason we're strapped into having to offer a 99, and I think we'll be going to like a once a month model on the 99 cents just to vacuum up more of the, the page reads. And, uh, and then people who once a month, like maybe right after the first, they can do the 99 cent sales. So, we can get a, a rank boost on the books to maybe get some more exposure, but also uh, <clears throat> not end the month with a low revenue day. Mm -hmm. We'll start the month with a low revenue day and then build up over the month using that, that rank bump to yeah. hopefully increase sales. Well, I know um, Ernie Dempsey who writes uh, thrillers. He, he talks about his, um, you know, his, his audience is similar in that they've made it very clear what they can pay for a book. So he, his pricing is always two ninety nine. He doesn't really deviate from that except when he does specific promotions. Yeah. Right? So when he's pre-order, it's two ninety nine. When it's set, when it's out there, it's two ninety nine. But there are times when he does specific promotions, um, usually tied to him, you know, doing, you know, some type of advertising or maybe he gets a book bub deal or whatever it might be. That, yeah. But it's like there's quarterly or monthly deals. I can't remember how he does it, but <coughs> that if, if you, you know, it, I think all retails kind of change, right? It used to be like a sale was a big deal, right? There was a spring sale, yeah. there was a fall sale, but like now everything's on sale all the time. 
And if that's not good enough, go to the outlet mall, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, if everything's on sale all the time, there is no sale. Right. Right. You're so just saying. that's, that's the discount prices. And that's uh, an integral part of your pricing strategy is how often do you discount? What do you discount? And then what do you do about it when it's discounted? So uh, books like this book seven, it was 99 cents. It won't be anything other than regular price from here on out. Mm-hmm. Now, when, when we put it into a box set in a year, uh, I'm a big fan of a year, let the uh, mm-hmm. individual book sales run their course, even though box set are a little bit different audience and you do have some overlap, but let's, uh, I, I like to stretch it out. Mm-hmm. So book seven, when it's in the box set, then it'll be discounted uh, uh, as part of the box set. But otherwise, this is it. I discount mm-hmm. book one. Book one will go on sale once a month, once every couple months for 99 cents or whatever, and I'll run promotions, whether it's paid newsletter or newsletter swaps, or uh, pick up the ad spots, uh, do some BookBub ads on uh, 99 cents. BookBub ads, there are people who are successful at full price, uh, but uh, it's like uh, the magic mojo. For me, it, it really needs to be on sale or even free, and not just free in KU. You see those ads all the time free free like free to buy you're talking about with bookbub with bookbub ads yeah not feature deal um i certainly have heard the same thing from other authors um that are doing well with bookbub is that understand the demographic there those are they're whale readers but Mm -hmm. they're discount whale readers yes um and under you know bookbub has come out and said that no they're, they're prepared to pay full price um you know what they say in, is what they be say in Vegas. Is, so you can yeah, talk and what they them. say in a cert what what people say in a survey doesn't necessarily mean that the behavior yeah, is going right. to be demonstrated on a daily basis, right? Yeah. Um so what I've seen from the folks that have uh done well with that is they're um looking they're they're really clear in their objective and this gets to kind of the whole price strategy thing is the strategy piece. It's like I'm trying I'm, I'm bringing in people at, from this channel and it's going to do two things. Either they're already existing KU uh, subscribers and they're going to funnel into that side of my business or there's a smaller percentage that will um, buy this book and you talk about it in one of your things in the book about how you figure out like the, the people that get this deal, how many become people that actually then buy in and read through the series, right? If you know yep. those numbers, then you can, you can figure that, that out and see if it makes sense for your business. <clears throat> makes financial sense. That's right. Yeah. Cause if you can, uh, if you can bring somebody on board for 99 cents and 15%, 20% of those people who buy that book one, then go on to read book two, three, and however many you have in your series, you can look at it and say, well, if I can get one person into book one, 15% will go to book two. That means this much. And, uh, and then 90% will go to book three. So that means if for that one person, I'll make $9 and 47 cents. So mm-hmm. I'm willing to spend $5 to get that one person on board at 99 cents. Now that's kind of a, a, a harsh ROI, but when you look at Amazon ads and those things where people say, look at the bids. Well, that's Amazon trying to run their business and get you to pay the maximum amount possible. Mm. But also it's people like me who says I can, I can find and afford a 99 cent reader and pay $5. People Mm. like that makes no sense. Well on this one volume, however, with the calculate the read through. So yeah, if I if I have my bids at five dollars and yours are at forty two cents, mine are going to get service. Now I don't do that. Uh, I don't need to. I do have some bids at one oh one oh one. I think is my highest uh, bid, <clears throat> but that's a very competitive uh, category. Mm-hmm. Trying to get those readers into my series. I, I mean, but I have a uh, I have over a hundred and some books. I have sixteen different series. So if I can get one reader on board and they become a super fan, that's worth hundreds of dollars. Well, and to your point, if you look at, if you go on uh, Google Ad, AdWords and you do search on some of these words and you're like, how the hell is somebody paying $50 for that keyword? Well, the reason is, is because 
it might be a personal injury law firm. Yeah. And they know that back injury turns into million dollar cases, right? So they don't, they, they, that's, that's where this whole thing with, with bidding and thinking through this thing, somebody's done that math and said, it's okay to spend $50 and be the top guy on that Google search for back injury because we know that out of those, all those people that click on that, we are going to get that one case that we are going to get 30% of that settlement. It's going to make us all this money. They've yeah. done the math all the way through and know what that probability of, of you know, outcome is, right? Yep, yep. Um, you know, it's the fallacy that people tend to like, um, you know, when you're looking at bit, you're, uh, you're selling something, you're doing proposals. If you don't figure out the win rate of the proposal, right, you always focus on the biggest proposals. It's like, oh, we'll put our best people on this $100,000 proposal. Well, if you don't have um, a good chance of winning it, let's say it's only a 20% chance of winning it, right? And you have a 60% chance of winning a $50,000 proposal. Really, your effort should be on the $50,000 proposal, right? Because the probability of what you can make on that, the percentage probability times the value is mm -hmm. way higher, way higher. So, you know, in, in this case where we're looking at like a promotion, where yeah. you start to paint through that and see that, oh, all right, it's not just about me getting a bunch of people in ranking moving up. It's about I'm trying to get a particular customer yeah. that has this read through. That's my <clears throat> objective. That's my real objective. Yeah. Rank, rank is a, a misnomer, and I'm sure I've uh, contributed to that uh, a, a fair bit. It's about the rank is simply a barometer of health. Just like your book rank and your author rank are two different barometers, but neither tell you that if you look outside, it's raining. <laughs> they, they, give you a, they give you a number. So it's like, okay, that's a good number. That's a good, things should be okay. But if you sell all your books at 99 cents and you have a great author rank and a great book rank, you're not making any money. Mm. <clears throat> it, it, so you're not making as much as you could if you had a, a, a more dynamic pricing strategy, shall we say like 99 cents for the first book. And if you can get them in there, then you start making uh, real money. <clears throat> so uh, getting the readers on board is, uh, is part of uh, a significant effort within the book pricing strategies, talking about, about f the value of free. I, I try 99 cent first because uh, just trying to get those people on board, if they buy, if they pay something, then they're more likely to read it. I want them to read it. The uh, two TBR, the to be read piles mm. of people who download free books are immense. So uh, if you get 100 people downloading your, uh, your free book, you might get two people to read it. And these are good people in your genre. So I say, I say free for last. Perma free mm -hmm. is nowhere near what it used to be. Now, it still has a value based on targeting. How are you using your perma for years? You just you scattering it to the wind and hoping readers come to you. I mean, mushrooms do that with uh, with pollen and stuff like that. So <laughs> it's uh, I, I'm not sure how that works out for them. <clears throat> but uh, uh, bringing the readers on board. So if you have a perma free and you're using it to get emails, well, you're not giving it away for free. You're getting their email, and that mm. is something. If you're uh, if you're just casting it out there, well, you can you can improve your odds by targeting an, a genre very specifically mm -hmm. newsletter swaps, very targeted ads very specifically. And you can't do that all the time because it's really, really expensive uh, for a 1%, 2% read mm -hmm. and then possibly only a 15% read through after that or a 50% depends on the quality of the book. Mm -hmm. And this is what Mark Dawson goes into with his one-on-one -on -one courses. He offers three full length books for free. If you, if you join his mailing list mm. and he's betting that you're going to read those and like his books mm -hmm. and then keep reading. And he's got what, 35, 40 books, uh, titles now. So you keep reading. There's a big value to that. So, but that's a different strategy with your free. I discount to 99 cents first because that improves my odds that they'll read my book. Mm. Well, and, you know, the, the story that comes to mind for me is, you know, Jamie Albright and how, she got her career started uh, by she had a she was 
she's not a fast writer. She'll be the first to admit it, right? One a year. Right. And she's worse than that. She's surrounded by all these people in 20 books that write a book a day. So like <laughs> a book say, a month, <laughs> book a month. And, uh, uh, but what she, what she did was, is just what you talked about. She, um, she worked on her newsletter. She had a short story that was free. Right. That and got she you personally to- is hilarious. Yeah. So her brand is I like this person. Her, yeah. her posts, her whole social media presence is just funny. Right. So. And, and when you, when you signed up for her newsletter, it was like the story, right? Like you, you, she used that newsletter and I, I know some other romantic comedy writers that they spend a lot of time on that newsletter, right? Because that, that's how they're getting people to make sure they pick up the book because they're like, Oh, that newsletter was hilarious. Yeah. I think I'll yep. read that book. If she's that funny in a newsletter, She'll be that funny in the book. And yep, then yep. she had conditioned that audience so that when the book finally did drop, they were ready for it. And by the way, she had built this list up that allowed her to go to the community and say, hey, I've got a list of X amount of people. Can I do a swap with you? And yep. all that, I mean, she did that on a budget. Uh, you know, like <clears> yeah, you don't zero. have to spend a whole lot. No. And, and she, uh, she's speaking in Vegas. <clears throat> and we'll be talking to people about that one book a year. And she's making uh, full-time money off that mm-hmm. because strategy, she did the strategy, she built her presence and that's what you need to do. You need to find the readers. In her case, she was able to, it's easier to sell 10 books to one reader. And that's my model. But if you sell 10 books to 10 dip, or you sell one book to 10 different readers, that's her model, but she engaged it well with, the social media and building her personal brand because there's is the book the brand or are you the brand Mm -hmm. and I'm trying to wicker it where I'm the brand now but I started with a series this is the free trader you need to read the free you need Mm -hmm. to read Terry Henry Walton and the series then was the was the brand and oh by the way I'm the author now now it's like hey I'm, I'm Craig Martell and oh by the way here I have some books I think that's a really good point um and you know anybody that has gone to 20 books, if you get a chance to hear uh, Jamie, it's worthwhile because she's got a great story that if, if you're just getting started, it's, it's a good story to hear how she stuck with it and made it happen in a way that no, any, everybody around her was saying is not the way to do it. Yeah. But understand yeah. that like there's, there was, she had some, some wind behind her sales because of the genre she was in mm-hmm. and that she could write to that genre, right? Like, Um, that's a genre where, um, you know, it's a much bigger pool of readers than what you write in. Yeah. Right. Well, and and she wrote a great book. Her first book was a great book and that's why it found traction. So people were willing to share it, Mm -hmm. which is also, it's so important. I mean, the, uh, people say, well, you write a book a month that can't be high quality. Well, you better goddamn write a good high quality book if you want to sell the next book. Certainly today. I mean, you, maybe two years ago you could write crap and get away with it because there wasn't anything to compete with, <laughs> but yeah, not it, today, yeah. right? Like no. No. Um, in your genre, military science fiction, look how that's changed, yeah. right? I mean, if Well, that I, started with uh, Chris Fox and his right to market. That kind of saturated that genre. And people are pulling back now, but it's a, it's a difficult genre to get into there is a healthy level of competition. So you better write a great book. Mm. And that's my uh, executioner series. We were talking about that before we went live. I just published book seven. It's at four ninety nine. That's my regular price now. And it's one of the best books. The last two books are just glowing, glowing reviews. The fans are, I can't wait for the next book. I couldn't put it down and I can't wait for the next book. The two things you want to hear because they love this book. And they anticipate that they're going to love the next book. And I delivered two in a row that were home runs. Mm. So it, uh, and these books took me six weeks to, to write each as opposed to one a month. And I released them three months apart because I, I had to write some other stuff in between and, and conferences uh, take mm. time. So three books apart. So I'm not publishing a book a month in this series. And it took me six weeks to write it. I kept going back. I kept rewriting it as I was writing it, as opposed to just jamming the words and going back and doing an edit and then sending it off to the readers. I I really uh, made sure that I got these right. And even for me with everything else going on six weeks, still 
it was like, oh man, look at how much of your life you don't. Six four ninety nine is all you're gonna. Yeah, that's right. That's what the market will bear for this genre for this mm -hmm. book, and I'm selling them for that. I'm selling a, a good quantity of them for that. And with that latest release and the social proof, the fans saying, "Geez, here's a, here's another one. I love these books." People go back and say, "I, I haven't started this series." So I, I get a lot of those notes. I'm, mm. I'm going to go start it right now because. And yeah, on, on that point, I, I think you did a survey on this. Um, when you survey your fan, have you surveyed your fans? Mm -hmm. And out of those fans that you've surveyed that are on your mailing list, do you know the percentage of ones that haven't read all of your series? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I We surveyed them a couple times. I had 550 responses, so it was pretty statistically significant. Yeah. And I had... Uh, when Terry Henry Walton, I had like 97% read that one series, but that series made like 300 grand. I mean, mm -hmm. I would think that every everybody uh, uh, on my list would have read that. And then it dropped off. And Free Trader, which is my backlist, that's not published with LMBPN. That's one that I've published myself. That one only had like 50 or 60%. So what I did is I dropped number one to free, hit my list a, a few times saying, hey, you, you guys should read this. It's free. You can You can get into it and see. And that bumped that up. Those sales have been great ever since. That was over, over a year ago. And that series, this year, three years after I published it, I've already made 15000 on that series. Right. So, so th that's really, I think, important for folks to understand. Like, that's a, str that's a pricing strategy, right? Like, you, you identified a market that you had, like, like low-hanging fruit, and you hadn't quite picked it yet, right? So you, you figured out a strategy to get that <clears throat> turn into cold, hard cash, right? It's like, yep. here's this audience. They're untapped. It's low cost for me to market to them through my newsletter. Let me get them, let me make it interesting to them to do this, right? Yep. I think those, when, I think too often with authors, they're like, well, I want to be like this person or that. It's like, look in your own yard, what you can do right there on your mailing list that, you know, if you've got multiple series, how, how saturated are they? Yeah. I know for a fact from some of the authors I work with, they're the same situation where there's a big series that they brought people in on and people didn't even know they wrote other stuff. They had, didn't even know that those books existed. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's my, my thriller. I always lament, Hey, my, my, the best book I ever wrote, I've sold like, you know, a few hundred copies and that's it. And on my, my survey, it showed like 7% of my, my readers. So I dropped it to 99 cents because I'm not going to give one book away. There's no, there's no second book in that series because the first book sold so badly. And so I sold a few hundred copies. So I made a hundred bucks on a book that usually sells nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, picked up a lot of great reviews. So now it has double the number of reviews and they're all, those are all five stars and Hey, my God, this is, you need to write more of these. This is a great book. And I, I, and I agree. It's the best book you've ever written. Oh, thanks. I, I, you know, might slam my other books, but no, not really. I mean, it's a, <laughs> but it's a thriller. It's a separate book. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but uh, these are th those kinds of things. Asking your readers is a huge, huge benefit to your marketing strategy. Oh, for sure. I mean, let's let's be really, really clear where all of the money comes from. It does not come from Amazon. It does not come from Kobo. It comes from readers, right? Like, if they stop paying money for books, everything collapses, right? Yep. Right. That and and the the reality that we're in is, you know, while particular parts of the marketplace that used to serve it, like the traditional publishers are really suffering because of their business model. The actual amount of money being spent on entertainment tied to the type of intellectual property that you, you create is bigger than it's ever been. Yeah. Right. That's books, right? People are like, Oh, nobody reads anymore. Yeah, they do. They read a lot and they're reading all kinds of stuff on their phones and their devices and the reason they're yep. reading all this freaky stuff is because they don't have to hold a book up in the air on the airplane anymore. Yep. Yep. <laughs> um, and then you open it up to audio. I, I am an example of somebody like audio has profoundly changed my life, right? Because I listen to, uh, I'm, I'm digesting more books than I ever have before. 
because I can do it um, when I'm doing other stuff. And I do it at 1.5 speed. Okay. Right? So, um, especially for the nonfiction, right? So, you just think about that if you're an author and you haven't tapped into audio. Yeah, yeah. I have, uh, I have almost all of my titles in audio now, almost all hundred. I mean, I have a lot of audio books. Mm. <clears throat> I get notices. Uh, I have six different notices for audio books that they've been uh, approved and here's your, here's your codes. And I haven't even copied them down yet or done anything with them <laughs> because I'm so behind <laughs> trying to get those. But I've got, I've got a whole series now that is now in audio and I haven't done anything with the last two books because – yeah, but now, but uh, that is a huge market. Giving away audio codes is also a big benefit to uh, getting that interest in your books. Mm -hmm. Longer, in my case, I had one th uh, three book series that I did just a single audio on, twenty nine hours. Yeah, it cost me a lot to do it because I paid uh, paid up front. But that one is my best seller by far because mm -hmm. it's almost thirty hours of audio yeah. and for one credit. Yeah, that's crazy. And, you know, if you're doing stuff, you know, find a way will be at, um, um, yes. at the conference, you know, they're doing some really interesting things with how, not only how you can get your books made, but that distribution that they have is, is staggering, right? Like people say, oh, I want to get in a library. Well, I'll get you in the library and as soon as you get your audio book up there, I'll get you in more libraries yep. in Europe, right? Like. Um, and I know with my audio books, um, about 30% of the sales are coming from libraries now. Yeah. You know, Cause borrows, once the library gets it, they pay for a borrow, a, a rate based on borrows. Just yep. on borrows. Right. So you get a, you know, buck 60 or whatever it might be for the book. Um, but I, that was another strategy where I went to my list and said, Hey, I know that audio books are expensive. But did you know you could go to your library and get an app, app and listen to them for free? And people, I had people write me back. I didn't know I could even do that, right? Like, so you're helping them find a way to deal, you know, with how to get your book for, for in their respects, free. But best yeah. thing is you get paid. Yeah, yeah. How to help them pay you more. Yep. Yeah. Um, so we talked about... Uh, we do well, this and, and the thing with audio, before we leave audio, yeah. the thing with audio is if you discount your book, your ebook on Amazon, usually that gives you a discount. If you buy the book, you get a discounted rate on the audiobook. Because if you're through Audible, and I have a lot of books through uh, exclusive to, to Audible, <clears throat> but uh, when I book, put a book on sale, they automatically discount the uh, Audible copy. Mm. So you can buy for 99 cents. And, oh, by the way, here, pick up the. Uh, the audiobook for a bargain as well. Yeah, and I've done that. I've um you know, I I I fall for that sucker play every time. <laughs> it's like, oh really? Right? Like uh, yeah. I'll see a book and it's like, well I want to get the book because I want to be able to highlight stuff and I want it for reference. And then they'll be like, well and you can have the audiobook. And it's like, you know what, I end up listening to the audiobook. I never but I know yeah. that I have the 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 ebook there to go back and look something up if I want to cite something in my work or whatever it might yeah. be. Right. So, you know, what ends up happening is, is what could have been, let's say, if, you know, if it's like a nonfiction book would have been a $9 sale on an ebook turns into a 17 to $22 sale with two clicks. Yeah. Yeah. Nice work. Yep. Yep. But well, it's, uh, it's maximizing the profit uh, yeah. profitability. So, and that's, I talk about that a little bit in, uh, in the book, I'll have to double check the audio section, make sure that I highlight that you get discounted. If you, uh, if you're exclusive to ACX and, oh, by the way, you discount your ebook, they'll, anybody that buys the ebook gets a discount on the, on the, uh, associated audio. Mm -hmm. So we talked about, um, uh, full price. We talked about, um, free, we talked about discounting. Do you want to um, kind of just mention a little bit about some of your thoughts around folks with uh, KU and um, how to think about pricing with KU and some of your experiences with that? Sure, sure. I, I've, I looked at that market hard and uh, I had a recent book that I put on sale, a, a, a 
an omnibus edition. <clears throat> the lowest I could price it was one ninety nine because it was pretty girthy, right? If you're over three megabytes or whatever for the uh, uh, your your Mobi file, and that's after it's converted, <clears throat> then uh, the lowest you can price it is one ninety nine because mm-hmm. uh, Amazon is covering the download, right? Well, I did that, and uh, I saw I saw sales were huge at one ninety nine, and I was really surprised. My 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 watch died, <clears throat> and and I jacked up the the price to two ninety nine as soon as possible, and sales did not diminish. So I had exactly the same sales at two ninety nine. But with a big download fee, so it was uh, like two point five times the uh, royalty rate. Mm. So instead of a seventy cents, I was getting like a buck fifty, buck seventy, as opposed to what two oh nine. I think at two ninety nine, seventy percent is two oh nine minus download fee. Usually it's about ten cents. So buck ninety nine for a two ninety nine title. Well, I was getting about uh, what a buck, buck fifty to buck seventy. So a little over double uh, for no change in sales. So it's like, oh my God, I donated, I donated <laughs> like a thousand dollars of of money because I had it at one ninety nine instead of two ninety nine. And uh, so I looked at, I looked at that, and I was still getting sales, right? But I wasn't getting the page reads. So when I, I they were just starting to trickle in, and page reads will start nine to fourteen days. We we have a lot of data that suggests nine to fourteen days after your own sale. Well, when I priced up to four ninety nine, then the page reads came in. And now the page reads have been consistent at that level for two months now that they've been consistent at the highest level they've ever been for this one series. It's a free trader series because I priced it up to four ninety nine for that, uh, that box set. Mm-hmm. And so four ninety nine I get, and I changed the, I changed the uh, inside. So it's uh, smaller. So I get 15 extra cents uh, as opposed, I saved that much on the download fee. <clears throat> so I get, Either like three fifty on uh, on a royalty, or I get thirteen fifty on a page read because it's almost three thousand pages. Mm. So if I get a complete page uh, page thing, but I put it in enough hands, and at four ninety nine, that was the magic price where if people had KU, they picked it up in KU, and some bought it. So I'm getting a comparable amount of sales, but with three fifty, you don't have to sell a whole lot, and but the page reads are up and. And uh, 299, 499 were the magic numbers to get the KU page reads for me. 99 cents encouraged people to buy it, not borrow it, which mm-hmm. I asked people why. Because I'm like, why, why don't you just pick this up in KU? And they said, well, I love your book. So it was, it was uh, you know, hey, uh, good for me, good for the ego stroke, however you're costing me money. I, I'd prefer <laughs> if you actually got it in KU. So I started pricing it up, just changing it, trying to get them to borrow it instead. Because let's see, I can make three fifty or thirteen fifty. Okay, I'm going to go with the thirteen fifty. All right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that that's one where again we go back to that word strategy, where you're trying to strike the balance, and um, you know, there's some people who are just going to buy books. Yep. They, yep. they they're not into the subscription idea. It's just not their thing, right? And so, price it appropriately for them whatever that price may be, but then understand that you have this other market. And for most authors that I know, um, you know, it's a significant part of their business is their KU reads is what they're doing to, to, to get those numbers up. Um, you know, and I think that, um, you know, with box sets, one of the things that I've observed, and we were talking about it earlier, but thinking through that strategy really clearly like you have, because, box sets will cannibalize your, your other page reads, right? So. The, the box set page reads will cannibalize your other, yes. Yeah. But the, uh, the pricing on the, the Omni, mm-hmm. I still get sales at nine ninety nine, but they don't, I don't get twice as many or half as many sales. Right. I get even less than that. I get 10, 20%. So at four ninety nine, I'm getting enough sales. I'm forcing or encouraging people to, to go read it in KU instead. And so it's a really nice balance. Mm-hmm. So I haven't gone up to nine ninety nine yet. I was at nine ninety nine, dropped it down, then it's climbing back up. But fairly soon, sales are starting to finally drop off. So I'll jump it up there so I can discount it later. 
Yeah. And, and the ind the individual titles are all four ninety nine and I'm still getting sales on those because I'm I'm marketing them as well through separate Amazon ads and Facebook ads. Mm -hmm. Just not spending a whole lot, but they're more than paying for themselves. Because when you go to Amazon, the series isn't linked to any omnibus or box set editions. It's uh, if you're looking for one, whatever comes up, it's not gonna say, Oh, by the way, there's a box set. Don't buy the individual books, you can buy all nine in a box set for four ninety nine. People don't mm -hmm. even see that, and mm -hmm. it's not like a bait and switch. I I, I don't know how to do it myself uh, uh, when I go on Amazon and I'm looking for a box set because a lot of times it it won't come up. You really have to dig deep to find that uh, that box edition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I my observation is with that is it, it has to be part of your overall strategy and what you're doing with that series. So certainly it makes sense where I've seen folks that are. Um, aligning box set launches with where they are in the overall series. So um, yeah. they know how to use that, especially the first box set as a tool to get people into the series. Right. Yeah. So it's, um, you know, the whole idea of that box set really is, is to get a slot in somebody's KU. Um, and that when they get to the end of that, that they're going to want to jump into the series now. Right. So and, and timing. I, I don't have box sets until after a year because I really, really want the individual timing, books. Yeah. And then the end of the box set, if I have a box set of one to four and like a, a executioner series, <coughs> I do have a box set of one to four. I have five, six, and seven out now. When I publish eight, I'm going to wait a long time before five to eight come out as their own separate box. So at the end of box set one to four, I have a link to book five. Mm -hmm. Not the second box because second box doesn't exist. So then we pick them up and get them at four ninety nine each for the readers because they love me and my story at this point in time. And you've got to have confidence. Don't uh, don't do the uh, 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 thing where you doubt yourself. Uh, self doubt is not going to be beneficial because if you've got four books and you're making any kind of sales, you have fans, mm -hmm. and those fans will want your next book. So give it to them. And give it to them proudly, stand, t stand tall and just say, hey, book five, here it is. Uh, enjoy. Yeah, I, I think that that's, um, you know, with, with <coughs> most authors, even guys that are making really big money, they, they don't see themselves as that brand you talked about, right? They're just like, hey, I'm just like this stay-at-home mom that started writing books and, it, yeah, but you're making a quarter of a million bucks a year. <laughs> Okay. And to do that means that there's a lot of people out there that don't see you as a stay at home mom, or they see that as part of the brand. You have to be um, as excited about those books as those people are. Right. Yeah. Um, and understand that, you know, it's a really, really big deal for people to give up their cold, hard cash for anything. Right. And to do it for something as ephemeral as a book, which is really a, you're selling an emotional experience. An ebook. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's, that's, that, that's a big <laughs> deal to be able to pull that off. Um, yep. so don't, don't take that, that lightly for sure. <clears throat> um, and writing a book is hard. And, and for those folks who are still struggling, it, it's hard because how many people say, I want to write a book, but then they never do because it's freaking hard. But then you write a first and then the second is eat. They get easier as you go. For sure. For sure. And I, I think that that's, um, that's real important for um, us to also talk about. I don't know if we mentioned it earlier, but um, all of this stuff um, that we're talking about with pricing strategies or advertising that we've talked about in other videos, all of that comes as secondary or tertiary to writing books on a regular basis that people want to read because the data that I've looked at and I've looked at a lot of it, nothing has the impact on sales that a new book does nothing. And I'm talking about, I'm looking at people that spend $40,000 a month in advertising, but the results they have, like they're ranking differently than somebody that's not advertising, right? Like they're at a different spot in, in the rank category. They're always running in the top 100, let's say, but yeah. when they bring out, when they bring out a new book, right? Like everything shifts at this, at this other magnitude, right? It's yeah. their, their books are coming out and doing what 30, 50,000 bucks a month, right? 
Whereas you're like, oh, I only sold 500. Well, don't forget that that person I'm talking about has been writing for 12 years. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> they yeah. didn't. And, they and didn't. slowly building that audience yeah. and getting better at writing. Well, the that's the big thing. Better at something is you keep doing it. Yeah, I think that that's what gets. Um, we, we're so it's so easy for us to filter out all of that, right? Is it's yeah. oh, this person just got in the top ten on Amazon. Okay, that's one book of thirty three books. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and they've been writing since they were in college. <coughs> Um, and so that when you then start to look at that, yeah, there was this, all this work that went to making this thing super, super successful, right? Yep. Um, that those words are never discounted that were in those other books that helped that person find their voice. Right. Um, so don't, you know, that, that's gotta, I think always be first and foremost in any strategy is okay. Like what is my, what is my production schedule? How many books am I putting out? Why into which markets? Yeah. To how many books, the very best quality I can manage, can I get out? Because mm -hmm. getting more but reducing your quality, that's not going to work. You have to have, because I mean, Michael and I had a, a significant infrastructure that uh, is now in place to produce books quickly. And I've even drawn back just because the conference takes so much, so much time. And I did four conferences this year. So uh, I've drawn back because I needed to focus and it took me six weeks to write a full length book and, mm. and it's okay. It's okay. But don't, don't undervalue your work. Don't overvalue your work. Oh, I spent six weeks writing this book. And even though it's a little bit better than the other ones that I wrote in two weeks, it's the same price. It's not like, well, let me price it three times much, as much <laughs> because it took me six weeks. It doesn't work that way. A yeah. market, whatever the market will bear is what you need to price your books at. Yeah. I mean, you had that, your, your little formula at the beginning about <laughs> that was a nice inside joke. I thought, um, yeah, yeah, that, yeah, it's, it's all that and what the market's prepared to bear. Right. Yep. Like, um, and, and that's where, that's where in the book, my, my whole effort regarding specific genres is research the genres. Only you will know your genre Based, and then you might not know it. Your readers could say, well, this seems more like urban fantasy than high fantasy. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and you're like, oh, man, I thought, but nobody cares what you think. The readers, oh, you should care what the readers think. And this is the preponderance. Don't take that one outlier who gave you a one star and said, you suck. Uh, this, is, uh, this is something, this is grimdark. No, it's yeah. not. It's, it's, and then you find whatever, genre equals marketing. So the biggest group of readers who will like your book even though you do crossovers, nobody's in just one genre. So you find that biggest group of readers and then that's what you go after. So, and you look in there and say, okay, hey, nine out of the top 10 books are priced at 99 cents. Mm -hmm. Well, you look at that, okay, that's for, they put it on sale, they ran discounts, promotions, but then you look at the next 10, they're all 499. Ah, I want to be number 10 at 499 as opposed to number one at 99 cents. Mm. I bet you number 10 is making more money. So yep. this is where you have to balance it and find out. So four ninety nine, you climb up ninety nine, you get that extra visibility, you snag some extra readers, it drops back to four ninety nine, you maintain some sales, so you get that balance of more readers and a little more money too. Well, you know, you, you talk about that. Um, I'm, I'm, I think he'll be at the conference this year. But do you know Rob Peacher? Yeah, yeah, he's here. He's yeah. he'll be there. Yeah, so he writes westerns, and yep. you know, when I talked to him, he was you know one of the things that we talked about was he, he, he charges three forty nine 49 for his Westerns. Okay. That is way out of line with what a lot of other people are doing. Right. It's, it's one of those 99 cent genres. Right. Yep. yep. And he was asking me like, well, what do you think about it? I'm like, dude, if you're getting three forty nine, and your customers are paying for it, stick with it because do you understand how many um, books you have to sell? at 99 cents to get to what you're making in a 349 book. It's like 10 books. Like you just, you have, and, and there's very few times that volume changes that much. Yeah. Based yeah. on solely price. Right. Um, so if you can, you know, just understand that what's going on in your genre um, and, and make sure that, 
if you are pricing differently, you know exactly why you're doing it and why you're able to get away with it. In his case, it's because he writes a great book, right? His fans are prepared to pay that money for it. Um, so, I don't know. Well, and that, uh, once you establish that, that's uh, a lot of the box sets in my genre are 99 cents for box sets. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I, I'm trying to lead the charge and say, let's make our box sets two ninety nine on sale as opposed to 99 cents, because I'm losing my ass at 99 cents. I'm, I'm doing, mm -hmm. here's a year's worth of work. One series was a whole year worth of work for 35 cents. And I'm like, I, I can't do that. I just can't do that. Ten, two bucks, ah, okay. But 99, I just can't do 99 cents. So uh, I, I'm now all mine when I hit them on sale. And <clears throat> when I ran that sale at 299, I contacted the, because uh, uh, I had set it up for 99 cents. I'm like, nah, I'm going to do that at 299. They said, hey, no problem. We'll just change price. Easy enough. And I, I didn't see an appreciable difference in, in, in sales because the quality. You, you can sell the quality of that. Hey, nine books for $3 as opposed to nine books for 99 cents. That looks cheap. I've, I've bought a bunch of those and I, I'm like, I, I'm not even going to get into them. I mean, these are authors I like too. But I'm not doing them any favors by really they're trying to drive KU Patriots. So let's go 2.99. You either get it or you uh, you drive the, the drive the Patriots. Yeah, I I think that when you do, you know, when I think about the books box series and stuff that I bought at 99 cents when there's been deals, authors that I know, I'm just doing it to get. It's almost like research, right? It's like, well, I, you know. I'll, yeah. I'll throw a bone and it's there and we'll see if I can help him get some rank. And, um, but yeah, I rarely read those books. I rarely get yeah. into them. Um, and so I, th I think that, yeah, you really have, it gets, you know, back to that strategy piece. What are you trying to do um, overall with the book? Yeah, make as much money as possible without gouging anybody and without uh, screwing myself. Don't undervalue yourself. Don't overvalue yourself. It's a marketing strategy, and you can do all that uh, with pricing. Pricing strategies uh, will be out on November 8th. That's when it goes live. It's available for pre-order now. I get locked down on the 4th, which means I'll upload on the 2nd just to make sure. And, mm. uh, and, and I went assetless pre-order. So uh, uh, when I upload, uh, I'm going to upload just one copy. It'll be the final copy. So if you get a copy, it'll be the right copy. Well, and you can uh, know that November 8th is my birthday, so that'll be a good day for you. Okay, good. Clearly. Yeah. Clearly. Well, November 9th, I go to Vegas, so uh, I, I wanted to get it out before mm. before then. And I, 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 as soon as I have the final copy, that I'll get it formatted for paperback and have that set up as well. So the paperback should be live well before the uh, ebook uh, hits on November 8th. Great. So the great. paperback should be live maybe November 4th or 5th. Cool. Well, it's great having uh, another one of our sessions and we keep pushing it back, but next week we're going to do cash flow. We're going to do cash flow. Yeah. We didn't talk, we caught cash flow right away, but not much after that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll hit cash flow next week and, and talk about that. A lot of moving parts on cash flow and something that you really, really have to pay attention to as an author. Yes. Any independent business person. Yeah. It's, it, I mean, that's kind of been my thing. I've been talking to authors about it. doesn't matter what business you're in. Everything gets back to the evaluation of a business is the present value of future cash flows. It's, if, if your business doesn't generate cash, it's not going to be worth anything in the future. No, it's going to be tough. Uh, that's, Amazon operated at no profit for what, like 15 years, but they're gaining market share. Their future potential was massive as they gained market share. Well, and 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 um, don't forget that in that pro in that process, their cash flows were increasing, right? Like, yeah. while it was it was it was to a loss and negative, and they were using financing to grow that business, right? The cash, the actual amount of cash was growing, right? Rather and significantly, yeah. But they and were growing the business just in front of mm -hmm. that mountain of cash that was coming. And, and a lot of that money that was being spent was invested, you know, the, the Bezos's argument was, is this money is better spent on these things than us 
turning it into a profit and giving it back to our shareholders, right? It's like this money will make us more money if we go and invest it in distribution centers, if we go invest it in uh, 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 server farms, and he's proven it. It's right, yep. right? Um, you may not like the practices of how they went about doing it in certain industries, but, um, you know, the reality is, is that, even that business, though it showed a loss, if you go and you look at the cash flow statements, the cash flow was growing, right? Did all that money come from profit? No, because they had access to, I say I'm getting into cash flow now. Yep. yep. Next, week. <laughs> Next week. Next week. Next week. All right. All right, man. Good talking to you, man. Peace, fellow humans. Later.